Hello, everybody. I am here today with Herb Anderson. He is a good friend of mine. We've met recently, and he's an excellent podcast with a ton of information. Herb, how are you doing today? What's going on, man? I am doing fantastic. It's another beautiful Monday. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your full title that you go by at your company? Yeah, so I'm the CEO of Dealer Talk or DT Vendor Management Solutions. Um, basically, what we do is we help dealerships manage their vendors. So, which is an excellent segue because I met you when talking to one of our dealerships, Stephen Wade Toyota. We had a great conversation. Yes, How sir. did you first get in touch with Stephen Wade? Well, I, I, I've worked with the, with the Wade organization in some capacity for many years. I used to be their auto trader rep. And then when I went over to uh, GSM, um, one of the uh, distributors for Toyota, um, I worked with them there as well, with the, obviously with the Toyota store and some of their other stores on some um, other projects. And um, then I started the podcast, uh, my podcast a couple of years ago, and that led to some other opportunities and um, uh, eventually a full, full on partnership with them. So that's fantastic. So I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you have a pretty extensive school history. When did you know that this is the path that you wanted to go and why? Um, it's, it's funny because when I, when I started, uh, you know, my scholastic journey, if you will, I, I wanted to be a, an engineer, a, uh, um, like a software engineer. And um, I started working at this dealership as a, as a loop tech and tire technician just to kind of, you know, pay the bills and stuff while I went to school. And um, that kind of got me started and in, in kind of in the, in, the, in the industry. And then I had the opportunity to write service. And I remember uh, doing that. And then I was like, wow, this is it. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And I immediately changed my major and um, just kind of went in a completely different direction. But um, for me, I don't know. I feel like I was lucky enough to figure that out early that this, this was definitely something that I wanted to do for sure. That I wanted to be a part of this industry. And having that comp sci background too, makes you more of invaluable than anybody could ever imagine to be able to look at a website from a technical perspective, as well as a marketing or even just a logistical perspective. So that's actually really, really cool. And it's not too often a lot of people can go in college or find something right away and just take off with it right. and go as far as you have, which is yeah. awesome. So obviously, I mentioned before, you have a podcast, which obviously makes us mortal enemies. I mean, <laughs> expect dollars for every time you make a podcast. Uh, what is something, because you have a lot of guests on there. You have people from all different ages, agencies. You have people that work in dealerships. You have people that work for like, uh, you know, uh, speed response tools. I saw that one. That was a good one. Yeah. Uh, what is something that has stuck with you from after talking to one of these experts that, you know, you didn't know before? Yeah. You know what? It's funny because it's, it's a very selfish thing. The podcast itself, because I learned so much from it, dude. Like I don't think people really understand the value in doing this because I just such, such amazing conversations that I've had there and nuggets that I've taken with me and I've implemented. And it's like, wow, this stuff actually works, man. So, um, you know, this is just because it's, it, it was this season, this, um, you know, I'm still, it's still fresh in my mind, but probably the Jason Knight episode from Lot Links, like that was a really good episode for me. I, I really, I like his mind, you know, I like how it works and, um, you know, he's very eloquent and he can, he can really talk data in a way that, that it makes it super interesting, you know what I mean? And so I definitely appreciated that, that concept and, and the company, I mean, this sounds like a lot links commercial now, but I mean, you asked the question. So, but um, I like the idea of being able to market specific VINs specifically because, you know, when you look at your website, you're going to have um, some cars, you know, which is a small percentage that are going to perform really, really well, just because they're the right cars. Right. And that's what people is looking for or whatever. But it's the other cars, the cars that are buried, the cars that, that mm, mm, there's not a lot of shoppers, the cars that, that are not getting a lot of love, that those are the ones that we need that we need help with. And um, I like that, that, I, that concept of being able to do that specifically for those units. Yeah, because that's, cool. that's a huge challenge. I mean, they're buried for a reason sometimes, and sometimes right. just not at all. There's no reason at all. And you're like, hey, this, this car's been sitting on my lot for 150 days. Can we do anything to get this going? Yeah. So when you have those, having that VIN targeting either through ads or just on your website, just to be able to say, take you know, cars that have been on my lot, 150 more days, put them on a specials page so people can get some eyes on them. 
you know, maybe we'll do some retargeting around that to get people to come back. So that's really cool. And you're, you're right in that it's always surprising how much people know and how deep the pool is and people are yeah. all over the place. I've had people that are, you know, comp majors, comp sign majors. I've had people that was like, I was like, you know, for me, I was a line cook before this. And I, I trained all this myself and then got into here and then really liked what I did. So you get this from everywhere. And that's yeah. what's kind of cool is you get that different perspective on how things work in this. For sure. Yeah. And then the, the, the other thing is, is, you know, I don't know, man, it's just those, those the, the, the conversations stick. And I remember that I was like, dude, I'm having just all these amazing conversations. This was before I did the podcast. And I was like, how do I get this? How do I get people into these conversations, man? Cause I'm leaving these dealer visits and I'm feeling like, dude, like I learned a lot, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a good, it's been good in that way as well. That's awesome. So one of the things that kicked off you and I discussing this and having you sit down with us is just talking about websites as they are today. Uh, you and I have both very opinionated ideas of what the marketing experience and what just a customer experience should be in your website. Uh, what do you think of the current state of how automotive websites engage with customers today? Um, man, uh, geez. It, listen, I think that that we're definitely behind when it comes to that in the sense that we really haven't had a dealership take a major risk. When you go to every uh, this, I hate saying this because it sounds like a total generalization, but, you know, the majority of the websites that I go to, it just feels like the same website over and over and over again. You know what I mean? It feels like I've seen it in some way, shape or form. And so if I have that experience then I think the consumers are going to have that experience as well. And that's not a good thing, right? Because it means that nobody's standing out. But there's also a lot of opportunity in that because if you change your approach, you know, slightly, it, it's going to make a difference for the customer. I think the major problem that we have right now is that we've kind of advanced um, – the experience part, like we talk about it all the time in the industry is something that dealerships focus on a lot, but we haven't advanced that digitally. And what I mean is when you go to a, to a website today, it feels like it's the equivalent of walking into your into a dealership showroom and having a member of each department come at you at once. And everybody's telling you about what they have to offer and nobody's asking you, hey, man, like, what are you here to do? How can I help you? You know what I mean? And so, and this isn't my concept. Like I, this actually was is something that, that evolved. This, this talk uh, was evolved because of, of conversations on the podcast. Um, and I had a, a particular guest, um, you know, kind of opened my eyes to that. And I, it, I went like, wow, dude, this is, this, this, he's absolutely correct. Like this, this is exactly what it feels like. And so, you know, um, like if you go to Uber, right. And you, and you see their, their, their pathways that are right there, whatever you choose, it changes that experience, mm -hmm. right. And underneath it, it just changes the website because uh, Uber is asking you, what are you here to do? Is it transport? Are you trying to buy food? Like what? And then I'm going to tailor fit the website to meet that requirement. Right. And I think that that's what we need to do in, in the, in, in the, in the industry now. It's like, you know, maybe four things like, what are you, are you here to browse? Are you here to buy? Are you here for service? Or are you here to just learn about our dealership? Right. And every time they click one of those things, the experience changes to give customer that experience. I mean, if we're doing the experience thing physically, it's time for us to take that into our digital dealership or our digital presence. I don't know. I just, to me, that makes sense. No, it does. It makes complete sense. And I think a lot of this comes victim of just the nature of how a dealership and an OEM is this. I mean, the dealerships want to be all unique. They want to stand out. They don't want you, you to think that the Toyota dealer five miles away is the same thing as them. Or Toyota just wants to sell as many cars as possible. To them, it's not as big of a deal who's actually doing it. So they want, you know, or, you know, Honda or Nissan. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of benefits that comes with having a giant umbrella over top of you, especially with all that like PPC ads and then bidding on them for you and helping sure. traffic your site. But a lot of times these, you know, website providers struggle with this as much as the dealerships do, which is we're trying to make this person stand out. But we have to follow these very strict guidelines and rules to do so. And so it, you're, you're kind of going to go into this wall where, where it's like, 
if you give the dealers an opportunity to make their mark, it might change the industry. It might change how we approach websites because they're allowed to do something different. They're allowed to make their experience a little smoother, or, or like you said, a little more modern even. Uh, a lot of these, like you mentioned Uber, which is a great example of a good UI design for a website or even like a phone app. It's designed so that, uh, you know, somebody who has not shopped before can work their system. Mm -hmm. And something that I think that, you know, we as providers, you as the dealership or dealership partners has to understand is you have to make it easy because not everybody is a 20 year car buying vet that has everything in their mind already picked out and loaded. Yeah. Some people don't oh, know what a that's, churn is. That's a great point. And we forget, man, I think that we're so jaded because we do this every single day. You know what I mean? It's like, we, we don't, we've lost the ability to, to remember the, the joy of buying a car. You know what I mean? Right. Like we totally don't see that at all. And, 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 and that's caused our, 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 kind of our, our digital experience to go backwards almost. It's like, you know, you wouldn't have that experience that I described earlier physically. That would never happen. You know what I mean? But we do it on our website all the time. We don't even realize that it. it's like, okay, I mean, I guess, you know, that's just the way that it is. And, and we're like this and we're, we don't, we forget to see the, you know, kind of what's taking place there. But it, it I just feel like it's, it just feels to me like we're ready for something different. I, I, right. I, that's just, I don't know any other way to say it other than that. And evolution comes slowly. You know, we've, sure. we've seen some new things, you know, obviously with COVID last year, we've, everybody has beaten this topic to death, myself included, yeah. which is, you know, digital retailing. Oh my God, people are getting ready to buy cars online. Not really sure if they're ready to do that just yet. Sure. But where do you think the evolution is going to be? Where do you think the first big step is going to eventually take place on? Well, you know, I, I, I certainly appreciate that question because I've uh, and I've talked about it on, on my podcast, too. But so I've I, I how do I say this? I in the beginning of this whole of COVID, let's just start there because it's definitely there's been an impact, but it's not as dis I don't think we've described it yet the way that we should. But um, when COVID first hit, I kept hearing like, oh, the, the industry has changed forever. And I was like, really, how so? Like. You know what's really what's what's the change and then digital retailing was thrown in there as this thing but um i disagree i don't think that um COVID has accelerated that that digital retailing what what it did it, it, it created opportunities for all these these software companies to go to dealers and sell them a digital re retailing widget under the premise of hey you need to have this because otherwise you're going to lose business and in some cases that was the case right because your dealer was shut off and and i get that but I mean, you know, like if you look at the numbers, it's not like there's been this huge spike in online, you know, like online purchases. So I think what COVID really did, and this is what this is the benefit for the industry as a whole, is that it, it accelerated um, progress, not change, because change is going to happen whether you're ready for it or not, but progress. And what I mean by that is that the, that the decision makers at the dealership were like, listen, we got to look at this business we got to be open-minded, right? Because the little things that we had to in our, at our disposal that were advantages like digital retailing or picking up and dropping off customers or doing off-site off -site test drives, all these things are kind of common practice. And if they're not at your dealership right now, you're at a severe disadvantage or you're, you're in the process of making it, uh, uh, you know, implementing it as part of your process. And so with that progress, with the, what that's done for the industry is force creativity. And it's allowed us to really look at our business and be like, yes, let's try that. Let's do this. Let's go this way. Let's 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 just let's just try these different things to see how we can get that that next thing, how we can get that edge. And I think that 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 is the beauty of of the impact that COVID had in the industry, because, you know, think about it. If we're all being more creative or forced to be more creative, what's that going to do to the industry two years from now, three years from now, five years from now? You know what I mean? And so I'm really excited for that. I'm really excited to look back at these times and be like, man, that, that was the beginning of, of us thinking differently or of us, or of us becoming more open-minded in the industry and look at all that, what's that led to. Um, and we're starting to see those things come to fruition now, five years later, two years later, three years later. So. I think you hit on something really important there, which was it didn't hit everybody the same. 
some dealers who have been doing all this stuff for years, they like nothing changed for us. Right. We had everything ready. Some dealers were like, oh my God, we we're way behind. And it's like, you know, it's a it's a wake up call. It's a wake up call that, like you said, this is going to be forced upon you one day sooner or later. It's never going to be, you know, 90% of the web, 10% in the store. It's always going to be in the store. You're selling a car. They're going to want to check it out. They're going to want to sure. see it. You're always going to be selling the appointment online rather than actually the vehicle. There's some cases where I think you can get away with that, some business models maybe. But other than that, I think it's just going to be the nature of the beast. It's how, you know, I think one of the one of the biggest lies that is done in this retail space is that, you know, mobile traffic is 80% of your market. Not always. Sometimes it's 50. Sometimes it's 40. Sometimes the computer desktops still get more of your website traffic. You have to know your individual location and tailor it to it. But so with all that being said, we, we were talking a lot about like pricing online. And that is, you mentioned the joy of shopping. Let's talk about the fear of shopping, you know, yeah. the, the thing that gets everybody to, you know, pull back for a second. And really what I think is the number one thing to stop digital retailing from just completely dominating is you got to make a large purchase. So, you had some good thoughts on our call recently about, you know, how should dealers be doing pricing? What is the best way that really helps drive conversions? Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, it just, it really all depends because pricing is one of those things that you're, you know, you, it depends on your manufacturer, the incentives, all these things come into play. But the one thing that you can do is you can give a customer a reason why, right? And I think that a lot of times we miss that opportunity. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it's a product, right? And the, that product has a price and the customers are spending, you know, ungodly amounts of hours researching you, which means they're not just looking at your car, they're looking at everybody else's car. And if you think that the pricing isn't going to be a factor, I, I, I disagree, you know, I just do. So you got to give the customers options on, you know, out the door pricing, you got to give the customers options on, on payment, uh, you know, some sort of payment calculation or something like that. I know that that causes friction, but hey, listen, if I'm looking for a car and I go to your website and it says 27.5 and I go to your competitor's website and it says 27.5, but hey, I can, I can, you know, my payment's going to be 350 bucks. I just, that's more information. And, and that's, that's just going to, that's going to get, that's going to get my attention. Um, you know, but I also feel like that's an opportunity for us to capture valuable information as well. Like, for example, there's this company, again, another plug here. Sorry, man. I don't, I don't mean to. You can plug uh, away. Yeah. yeah. Super casual. So, so there's another company out there that I would urge people that are listening to this to check out. It's called Run My Lease. And what they do is they do this verific, this, this ver information verification for price. So you you um, tell the customer, you put the, your pricing on your, on your website and then you tell the customer, hey, to get the manager special or, or today's price, I don't like that, but you know, some dealers go with that. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I definitely would not do that strategy as a marketer, I'm just saying. But you can put a manager special, you can put get your free or, or get your, your, your um, I don't know, service gift or whatever, depending on, your, on, your, on the laws and stuff with it, wherever your dealership is at. And then you can verify that information. You can request that customer to verify their phone number or their email address, however they prefer to communicate. And then you know that that customer, number one, is serious because they went through that process. Number two, you know that you, you can connect with that customer. You can get them on the phone because it's a verified thing. And so you can leverage the price. A lot of people don't leverage that valuable uh, component of, of, their, of how their, their, they have their the, you know, their presence on, on their website. And it's a missed opportunity because it's not that customers are not willing to give you the information is that you haven't given them a reason why, like this company run by lease on the, on, on the stores that I work with, it's super cheap. It's probably the cheapest lead generating thing that we have. And it generates tons. I'm talking about hundreds of leads a month. So if you're one of those dealers that likes to get a lot of leads, this is a this is a very good way, a very effective way to do it, and it's all based on on the pricing strategy on 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 your on your website. Yeah, and tools like that they they're super helpful too because they can help to get again drive traffic and then actually you can convert. And we always talk about you know when we talk about you know your website and what's preventing you from making more sales. It's either one of two things every single time: how much traffic are you getting in, and are you converting it. 
So you have to look at your funnel and say, okay, we're getting a ton of traffic, but we're not converting it. We got to change that up to make sure that improves. Well, think about this too. What if I were at your dealership right now and I'm ready to buy that car and I'm like, okay, it was surprised. And you're like, well, you know, right. I, don't worry about it, man. Like, you know, just, just here's a car and you'll get the payment and you'll, you know, you'll get the first payment in 30 days. Don't worry about it. But you know, like if that's, if, if it's something that you wouldn't do at your dealership, you probably don't want to give that same experience online. Right. Right. I mean, I think that's a good, maybe not in all the cases I haven't really thought about this thoroughly. So I don't want to say something that, um, looks like we had a little technical difficulty there. Apologies. I lost you. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, you probably don't want to want to be offering that same experience digitally. I mean, give the customers all that information and, and, you know, the more information you give them, the better. So talking about information and giving them what the customers need. Uh, one of the things that you and I talked about um, was that our hatred of this, you know, marketing style content, which is just like put five paragraphs on your website and a banner at the top, boom, bam, you're done. You did your SEO strategy. Yeah, right. What, why do you think this has been just the trend when it doesn't exist in almost any other vertical, but it's, it's so widespread in automotive? What do you think dealers can do to get around that and prevent it? I don't know, dude. So I don't know where this th was, where this thing initiated. First of all, there's there's multi, there's different layers to SEO. Like, yes, content is critically important. I would probably say it's the most important thing, you know, just to have the content on your website. But that's not full SEO because you have the technical side of SEO that you need to pay attention to, right? You got to look at your schema markup. You got to look at your H1 tags. You got to look at all these different things that are going to help. Like, you know, there's now there's this debate that you have to have like over a thousand words or something like that. I mean, in some instances, that's the case, but that's not, that's not always. I mean, what are you trying to accomplish? And then are you using tools right. to look in your backyard to see what if you're trying to go with like, I don't know, um, uh, Nissan's near me in, 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 in Idaho or something like that. And there's like no dealerships around you and stuff. And there's no content created on that. Do you really need 1,300, you know, 1,300 article and question form and all these things to, I mean, you know, like, why not, why not instead create an experience, a content around that experience that has maybe a little, a couple paragraphs and stuff, and you have some reviews in there, and then you have some lineup of, of vehicles, and you have some photos in there with, with the, uh, what's it called, the alt, um, alt tags and all that stuff. Like, so that, so that it makes you more relevant with Google. That's a far more effective strategy than trying to write this, this humongous page of content that honestly is just going to bore your customer to death and they're not even going to look at it. It's not, it's not a full experience. Like, you know, like it's just not, that's not a well thought out thing. Plus, what if you're trying to rank for something and then you do, you use a company to do some sort of SEO review or keyword review. And then you find out that there's only like 20 people in your backyard that are searching for that. Like what, right. what's the point? You know, it's is that intent. really where you want to fish? Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and we, we as a company like tell our own customers all the time. I've had groups approach me and say, okay, I want to do your, these four sources, but I don't really want to do SEO on these two. And they go, wait, why? It's because it's you and zero people around you. Why would you waste money every month paying for SEO when there's nowhere to grow? You own the market. Type in any keyword with your name in it or your OEM and you're ranked number one. Where are you going to go? Exactly. So yeah. that comes down to the, then the second thing, which is bigger content pages do rank better. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a fact of the way, the way Google works, but mostly because it looks more authoritative. Well, yeah, but the, I, I mean, my point with that is I'm not saying that it doesn't help, but think about it. Like who is going to read exactly. that? Exactly, exactly. You know? So it's how do you make that content, like not just, again, like a literal wall of text. How do you make it engaging? How do you hide that content so your customers don't feel like they're reading, you know, a, a book at night trying to figure out whether they want to buy a car, but right. they're actually getting information. So there is a lot of what you're saying is completely and 100% true, which is, nobody's going to read that. Nobody's going to read 200 words. That's hard enough as is. So how do you get them to get, you know, even reading through one paragraph is amazingly difficult. So but the cool the thing is when you do those things, that's why if you create an experience and you're not so focused, that's why I'm like, 
who said that you needed, you know, all these words, like, yes, it's important. And like I said earlier, like, it's the, it's probably the most important thing. I'm not going to say it's not, but if you shorten that and you put pictures and you put your reviews and you give them some options at the bottom of some, that's a much better experience for the customer yes. than trying to create this humongous page just so that you rank higher. You know what I mean? And exactly. ultimately that's, it's going to be better for you because that's, what's going to stand out. The customer is going to remember it. They're going to appreciate the information. They're going to have a better experience on your website and you're going to win that customer over all the other websites that guess what are doing the exact same thing and have those really long forms that nobody wants to read. Exactly. And all of that comes from is they've read a guide online for SEO. They tell them put a thousand plus words on it and just don't think about it. When that's supposed to be industry agnostic, that's not taken to the fact you're trying to buy a car you want pictures, you have options to show them so much stuff or answer questions or have things on your page that aren't just like, you know, shoveling information down someone's throat so nobody reads it. So I completely agree. I mean, we, we, are, we are not against each other right now. I mean, because I, I look at these pages and I go, well, I, I don't want to read this. It's my, someone's paying me to read this and I don't want to read this. Right. So exactly. why would I, you know, at eight <laughs> o'clock at night when I'm trying to shop for a car, when I got to go to work tomorrow, why am I going to look through all this that most of the time your OEM covers anyway? So, well, and then, then let's not forget the technical and sorry, because, but I, I got to take an opportunity to talk about this too, because I, I love this man. So it's like, Oh dude, my black, I got to have a black because SEO, you know, like I need to have, you know, it's got to be updated and stuff. It's like, awesome. And then you go to find the block. First of all, you got to go through 10 different tabs on the menu, which is already a bad, it's already going to hurt you. Then you got to go and probably typically it's either on a, on a, uh, you know, about us tab and you open the about us tab and it's like the 15th thing all the way down there. It says blog, which again is going to hurt you. And it's like, dude, okay. I mean, kudos. Yeah. Congratulations for the content, but dude, there's, there's multiple things that you need to do when you're, when you're looking at SEO and it's like consistently across the board, you see that experience. And it's like, wow, man, like, I don't know where we lost the, the technical side. We don't talk about it anymore. There are actual big companies out there that are just promoting the content. Like I had one um, actually try to pitch me on, oh, you know, technical isn't important anymore. You don't need, it does nothing for you. All you have to do is put content on your page and you're good. What? Like, whoa. It's like, it's like 25% okay. of the battle. You have offsite you right. check out. You got to do the technical stuff. Your page is to be quick loading. Schema markup never gets the light of day like it should. I mean, you can do so many cool things with that to pull, have Google pull data off your website. There's some controversy about that and whether or not you want that in the first place, you know, to have the uh, little markup header on the SERP because sometimes people don't click to your site then. But either that, there's all these ways you can improve your content that's not just putting words on a page. And blogs, I, I, again, it just, I think there's an influx of digital marketing companies in this vertical who just think, okay, we have nowhere to put content. We're not smart enough to figure out cool ways to integrate this or smart ways to integrate this into the website design. We're just going to make a blog. We're going to put a content piece a month. Bing, bang, boom, you're done. Oh, yeah. I've seen some, I've seen some horror stories of blogs. I saw one that was like, Somebody's posting about like Chinese restaurants in their town, trying to get like local search. And it's like, what are you doing? This, is, right. this has no connection to anything they're trying to do here. I'm not yeah. going to land on that page and come buy a, you know, a Camry for you. I'm sorry. I might go out to eat that night, but I won't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> put, the, put the recipe of the week in there. Now, I, you know, like social is different. Like definitely you know, and on social media, those type there's there's some of those types of techniques that I've that I've seen techniques, excuse me, that I've seen work really, really well. But on your website, man, if they're there to look at Chinese recipes, you got an issue, a bigger, much bigger issue with your website than 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 having a blog for sure. You're totally right there too. Social media, when we recommend for a lot of people who use third parties to do their social media presence, it's totally fine to let them do that. Again, we have the service ourselves. We like to say, we'll take care of the technical stuff for you, the advertisement. We want you to be the personal because we don't, we're not your business. We don't have your customers. We don't have your style. That's you guys. That's got to come from internally. Unless you have an internal marketing team, then let them handle it. Right. But you're exactly right. You know, showing off people that just bought a car from you saying, you know, you know celebrating people who've been working in your company for a long time. That stuff does matter because it does humanize your business in a way that's not just gaudy and or kind of like cringy in a way. 
You know, you don't want to have some other company kind of doing it because it feels a little creepy. You yeah, want it's, to it's a fresh of breath there. It's a breath of fresh air, right? How does it? Breath, breath of fresh air. Fresh air. Yep. The breath of fresh air too, because you know, if they're if if you have followers and those types of things, and they're only seeing car stuff, it's like ah, uh, kill me now, right? If, right? Especially if I'm not in the market for to buy a car. So if you if you spice it up with some other stuff, like you said, and you create some some you personalize it you know you you create some sort of you humanize it rather what you, the word you used earlier um that goes a long way so i think that if you look at like what people watch on tv that's a big sign of why this stuff works the one of the biggest things in sports right now is those documentaries that follow a team for a year and they like mm. you, know, you get to learn the players and learn where they come from and get to talk to them and again, it's all, it's all real stuff. It's not like a reality TV, which is kind of like done up. And, and people get invested in that. They want to know. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll start rooting for a team in a game that you have no connection to. Like, you know, I'm, like, I'm an Eagles fan. So if I watch a Cowboys, why well, might not? But the point is, is that people want to know there's an actual person at the end of it. You're not just someone sure. they're going to argue a price with. So. Yeah, no, I totally agree. For sure. Absolutely. Herb, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed this. We might have to do a part two someday. Um, sure. If they you gotta were, come, you gotta come on my show now, man. Whatever you want, man. You let me know. I'll be there. I, I don't got a life. I just talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> <laughs> me too, man. <laughs> if somebody wants to find your podcast, what's the easiest way to do so? Just go Google and type "dealer talk podcast," and if you don't find it, then don't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I found it that way, so it should be pretty easy to do so. Again, I want to thank you for coming on. Herb Anderson, pleasure to talk to you. We'll talk for a second. Likewise, soon. man.